Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO Kurt Volker discusses foreign affairs, including the deteriorating situation in Syria. And we'll learn about a joint effort that provides services to the elderly and real-life experience to students. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Two new polls show that the presidential race in Arizona is a statistical dead heat. The OH Predictive Insights poll conducted after the first presidential debate shows Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump tied at 42 points each. Another survey, the Emerson College poll, shows that Arizona voters favor Clinton over Trump by 2 percent, which is within the margin of error. The Emerson College poll also shows Republican Senator John McCain leading Democratic challenger Ann Kirkpatrick by 16 points. And a programming note, we will have a debate between McCain and Kirkpatrick this coming Monday at 7 p.m. right here on Arizona PBS. And there are far fewer auditors keeping an eye on corporate income tax compliance in Arizona, so much so that one economist said that the state could lose upwards of $100 million in revenues. 26 auditors were recently laid off because of a $7 million budget cut to the State Department of Revenue, leaving only four auditors to keep track of 50,000 companies. Georgiana Meyer, a former economist at the department, told lawmakers that with only four auditors, there is likely no corporate income tax auditing going on. The Department of Revenue says that tax auditing and collecting have not been impacted. United Nations envoy to Syria warned today that the rebel-held city of Aleppo could face total destruction by the end of the year with thousands of lives lost. Here with the latest on the worsening situation in Syria and America's response to the crisis, former NATO ambassador and McCain Institute executive director Kurt Volker. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Ted? seems like every time I'm here, we talk about Syria. Yeah, and we it's do. Worse. We, and it's, it's never bad. Yeah. What is happening? What, Syria in general, Aleppo in particular. Yeah, it is just absolutely stunning. You have the Assad regime in power. They're being assisted by Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia. They are attacking a city, an entire city, not just military targets. They are leveling a city. 11 plus, 11 plus million people in Syria are already displaced from their homes. We have a few hundred thousand left still in Aleppo, and they're being targeted and being told to flee, told to leave, uh, just driving more people onto the streets. It is just stunning what's happening. And again, the target is Aleppo because it is rebel held, rebel held by way of ISIS, by way of uh, Assad. Right. Uh, Kurd who's, who's, well, who's the rebel this here? Is, this is principally non-ISIS rebels who oppose the Assad regime. And this does play into the religious conflict because the Assad regime is, is largely uh, uh, Shia, Alawite. And the Sunni population has supported the rebels that have been holding Aleppo and fighting against the Assad regime. He has tried to conflate all the opposition to the government as terrorists. Assad has. Assad has. Trying to say, if you oppose me, then you are a terrorist, and that makes you the same as ISIS or al-Nusra or something else. And by attacking them the way he has, he has actually in some ways forced them together because they're all fighting against a common enemy. UN envoy says total destruction possible by the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, the, the place literally turned to rubble. Yeah, well, you see the pictures now. It is almost there. And this was Syria's largest city before this conflict started. And you have a few hundred thousand people left, and it is literally rubble in most of the city as it is. And uh, he's offered to escort rebel fighters out, personally going there. But this is really just allowing Assad to complete this military takeover of these uh, areas from the Sunni population. Last month now, there was an aid convoy that was attacked. Looks like Russian warplanes were responsible. Um, what has been the response to this? Uh, it's, it's shockingly quiet. Uh, you don't hear the outrage that Russia says, oh, it wasn't us and they pretend that there is some mystery as to what really happened. There are only three air forces that fly in Syria, the United States, Russia, and the Syrian Air Force itself. We didn't do this. Uh, we're not in that area. We're not conducting those attacks. It was either Russia or the Assad regime, most likely Russia, given the ordinance that was found. 
So with that in mind, and you mentioned that the U.S. is flying in the area, there have been calls for a no-fly yes. zone, at least a partial no-fly zone in Syria. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? I think it's something we should have done a long time ago, and we still have to do it now. And it's got to be coupled with a safe zone on the ground at the same time. It's people have to have a safe place to be. And what you need to do is create a corridor that is both on the ground and in the air where we give notice to Assad, to Russia, these are the lines, we'll protect this area, you protect that area, we're not going to cross, you don't cross, let's stabilize the conflict. That can then give some relief to the population that is suffering dramatically and allow us then to turn the fight back to ISIS again. Um, what's happening right now is we're not willing to take those military steps, and so Assad and Russia are going to keep pressing militarily against the population. So what are we doing over there? Maybe a, a few strikes here and there, training? Yeah, a couple what? strikes a day against ISIS, and we're providing some training and equipment to some of the rebels who say that they will fight ISIS, but we're not supporting them in the fight against Assad, which is the life and death struggle that they're in. Um. You don't want to wish ill will on right. anyone or anything. But Russia, eventually, this, this is going to end, unless Russia, it, well, let's, let's start here. Mm -hmm. Is this a quagmire? Is, is this possible no. quagmire for Russia? No, it, it, and this is where you have to think the way Putin and Russia think about these things. First off, uh, they're happy, they don't need an exit strategy. If things don't go well, they can leave the next day and no one's going to blame them. They'll say, okay, we tried, we left, that's it. No need for an exit strategy. They don't need a defined outcome even. They don't have to achieve some particular goal. The conflict itself and the struggle itself enhances Russia's position in Syria politically and militarily, enhances Russia's relationship with Iran, enhances Russia's position in the Middle East. That serves their purpose as it is. They don't need more than that. Yes, but if, if, if the United States were doing this, reducing a city to rubble, oh, the tens protests. of that, well, the yeah. protests, not only here, mm -hmm. but around the world, we would be the target of goodness knows how many terrorist attacks from now until eternity. Why is that, where is the, the Muslim world outcry against Russia? Yeah, it's a great question. You know how the outcry would be if it were the United States, and we frankly don't see it right now. In fact, in, in Europe, where I was uh, earlier, well, last month in September, um, there's still the sense that, well, at least Russia is doing something because we have all these refugees, they're trying something without really coming, putting the two together, say, you know, what Russia's doing is causing the yes. refugee flows. But, I mean, you know, the idea that, you know, goodness gracious, Al-Qaeda was inspired by a military base in yeah. Saudi Arabia, just a base. Russia is, is massacring people. They are. And I don't, I don't see the world, and I don't see you especially don't. The, the Muslim world in, uh, rising At up. At the moment, you don't. Uh, Russia appears to be strong, appears to be acting decisively is um, supporting the Assad regime, and you know, people are giving Russia respect for playing a strong role. It's, it's stunning, but that's what we're seeing. Why is Russia so interested in Syria? Well, uh, partly it's the access to the Mediterranean. Partly it is the perception of having a global role and being a global actor. Partly the way that plays back domestically inside Russia. Putin sells the public this narrative that he is rebuilding a great Russia and making Russia a great power on the world stage again. People like that, and that allows him to then continue to have an authoritarian rule at home. What about the, the other countries in the Middle East, Turkey in particular? What, what's mm -hmm. their role in all this? Well, interestingly, Turkey, of course, shot down a Russian plane. We yes. talked about that on this program not too long ago. And then since then, Turkey and Russia have reestablished a cooperative relationship over many issues because they can both see that they have some shared interests of what they can do um, in uh, fighting some things in that region. What is Turkey fighting? I mean, we, are they fighting ISIS? <coughs> are they fighting Syrian Kurds? Well, They're always fighting a Kurd somewhere, the, it seems. Well, yeah, but the way the Turks would say it is the Turks are fighting terrorism. And these Kurds in Syria do conduct attacks, or through the PKK, which is based inside Turkey, conduct attacks against Turkey, so they label them as terrorists and don't distinguish between them and ISIS, just as Russia doesn't distinguish between some of these rebel groups in Syria and ISIS. So there is some shared interest there. But of course, a very big difference is that Turkey believes the Assad regime has to go and Russia is, is propping it up. Is that eventually going to come to loggerheads? I mean, it, it... 
Uh, well, I think this, what will happen here eventually is you're going to have to see some stabilization of dividing lines inside Syria. Syria will never be governed again by one group only. And you're going to have to have some, some lines of ceasefire, some dividing lines in the country. Things can stabilize around that. Then you can hope that humanitarian relief gets in and you create some order again. As far as you just came back from Europe, you've mm -hmm. spent some time over there. What what are you the refugee crisis over there? Any signs of that easing at all? No, no, it's not. There there was a period earlier this year, the the first few months of this year, when they had a deal between Europe and Turkey, where Europe was paying Turkey, and Turks were supposed to keep the refugees there or keep them from coming into Turkey to begin with. Then you had this military coup in Turkey. The government in Turkey cracked down massively against the coup plotters, arresting tens of thousands of people. Europe has then protested, oh, you're, you're cracking down on society here. And Turkey said, well, we don't have to stop the refugee flow if you don't want us to. <laughs> so it is going back up again. Plus, you have all the migrants coming up from Africa through Libya that has not tapered off at all. I was, is there an answer for this migrant flow into Europe because it sounds like I mean I'm hearing that Hungary you know is having mm -hmm. some problems with their with their government simply because of this one issue. I every mean, every country in Europe is having an issue over this. This is why we see the rise of the Allianz for Deutschland, the, yes, the rightist party yes. there, the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, the National Front in France, Five Star Movement in Italy. Everyone is saying our governments don't get it. They're not dealing with this problem, and we see it affecting us. Uh, culturally, economically, politically, and ultimately in security terms as well. Uh, ultimately, you got to stop the war in Syria and establish something else, and you got to help Libya form a government that controls its territory again. Those two steps would do a lot to actually uh, stem the refugee crisis. Can you do those two steps when so many human beings that used to live there, that used to have a sense of place and permanence there, they're not even there anymore? No, but you, you still need to do it. There are enough people there, and you've got to create some security and create a place. Ultimately, most refugees do want to go home. Uh, they want to be in their country. They want to be in, among their people where they are comfortable culturally and speak the language and to rebuild. But they can't do that without the security environment to, to be able to do that. And as far as, so, so basically what you're saying is Syria first, Libya maybe 1-1-A, one, one Get those, th get those things figured out. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, you, I don't know that you can wait on these. Frankly, if you're if you're the new president coming in, somebody will be in January. Uh, you're going to have Syria. You're going to have Libya. You're going to have Russia more broadly with Ukraine, and you're going to have China testing to see what we're willing to do, especially in the South China Sea. You're going to have to tackle all these things simultaneously. You can't afford to wait. Fortunately, they're different in nature. And the way I think you can summarize: you got to block Russia, destroy ISIS and engage China. I think if we can do that, we'll have a strategy anyway. Can you, are, we, are we ready and willing to engage China? I think so. I think so. That's the one where I'm most confident that we don't want to be in a conflict with China. We do have some shared interests and some shared values with China, and I think we can build on that. With Russia, we've got to block their aggressive and expansionist tendencies. And with these you know, these conflicts in the Middle East, we've, we've got to stabilize them. Last question before you go. We've, we've talked a lot about Russia. We just brought up China. What is the relationship between Russia and China? Uh, China is very patient. Uh, Russia has a declining economy, declining population, huge territory where they really can't even control all the territory in the east so well. And China has a huge population, dynamic economy, much more cohesive society, and a, and a government that looks after the people in society to some degree in terms of lifting people out of poverty and education and health. So China's patient. Russia would love to sell energy to China, but it needs Chinese investment to do it. And China doesn't want to pay an excessive price. It figures it can absorb things anyway. Interesting. So China's playing it out. Yeah, so they're, they're not, not at heads. They're not, you know, they're not at each other's throats. Yeah. Russia actually has more of an interest in getting money from China yeah. than China does anything from Russia. And China's being patient. Oh, what a world, what a world. Good to have you it's here. Thanks for joining us. great to be here. Us. Thanks for having me.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at a new joint venture to help both the young and the old. It's called the Collaboratory on Central, and it allows ASU students to work with elderly and disabled residents of the historic Westward Ho in downtown Phoenix. With more on all this, we welcome Michael Schaefer from ASU's College of Public Service and Community Solutions. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Thank you, Ted. Um, the Collaboratory on Central. Catchy title. What are we talking about? We're talking about ASU uh, leasing out 15,000 square feet on the ground floor of the Westward Ho property and in that space creating a innovative enterprise that brings together our students, our researchers um, to engage in collaborative research with the tenants and with the communities of Phoenix and greater Arizona. Now the Westward Ho, most folks know it, but you know some folks may have just moved here, haven't been downtown in a while. What's the Westward Ho? The Westward Ho was a hotel that was built in 1928. It was at the time the tallest building west of the Mississippi, uh, the first building to get uh, air conditioning, and for many years was the cultural icon, the gathering place of uh, the Phoenician population, in addition to the Hayes Adam uh, Hotel. But the Concho room, with this, which is within um, the Ho, held a very special place, cocktail lounge, etc. The Westward Ho was the site of Carl Hayden Day back in, I believe it was 1964, and excuse me, not 1964, 1962, uh, President Kennedy, President Johnson, the entire uh, national leadership and state leadership yes. came out to recognize uh, Carl Hayden at the Westward Ho. And a lot of movie stars stayed there as well, but it, you know, it, it's showing its age now. It's, it's not quite the icon that it once was, although you can't miss it when you're on Central. Yeah. It's still, um, right now, how many residents are in the Westward Ho? There are 300 people who call the Westward Ho their home. The property is actually owned by a development company based in Rhode Island that specializes in low-income housing. They've owned the property since uh, 1979 and converted it from a hotel into low-income housing. Uh, the Cathedral Development Group, they've been, I think, a very good steward uh, of the property, but the nature of the financing that's available um, called Section 8 housing provides very, very little service to the people who call that place home and the, the uh, most qualifying characteristic of the people who live there is that they're poor. They're on the lower end of the economic spectrum. They range in age from 23. A, oh actually, a, a, a individual is a former student of ASU who happens to have a disability and is uh, low income to probably 83 uh, or 84. And we see just the, the vast spectrum uh, within that. So you have now the interprofessional clinic going on here, correct? What, what is that all about? And give us just a general idea. We've got these folks most poor. I would imagine a lot of them may not have family around or maybe lonely, somehow disengaged. How do ASU students now get over there and help that situation? Yeah, so part of the deal that we had to cut to make this an affordable venture for uh, ASU was to uh, create a supportive housing tax credit for the benefit of the owners. And so the, the deal that was arranged and what we saw as the opportunity was an opportunity for our students to practice the trade that they're going to go into right across the street from our campus. And so we created a space that uh, we have uh, this semester alone, our first semester uh, running at full operation, we've got 40 students uh, from nursing, nutrition, recreational therapy, social work, um, uh, conducting their internship and their practicum hours there while meeting some of what we would call the psychosocial needs uh, of those tenants. A lot of the tenants come in, they need help on just navigating social services and where to go to fix something. I was walking through the space today and we had a gentleman in there who was having trouble with his cell phone. Yeah. Um, and so um, we've seen upwards every day of 15 to 20 tenants that stop in, have a cup of coffee. We've got a yoga group going on that's actually being led by one of the tenants. Um, and it's just a wonderful experience for our students um, to become connected and develop relationships with a marginalized uh, aspect of our society. Yeah, this, this, this really does sound like good stuff here because not only do you have folks that, again, are in need, they're just maybe in need of human contact. I mean, just that's having right. someone just show attention and, and show that they care, that's a big deal. But for these students, 
maybe they're not familiar with folks that might be older, different generations, a couple of generations removed, maybe, you know, have had harder times. It's a, gr it's a great experience all around, I would imagine. Indeed, indeed. And I think ASU's, we saw as our primary objective here, Ted, was to create a unique learning opportunity for our students. And our expectation is as a result of these experiences, these students will develop a lifetime passion for serving the underserved uh, and the less fortunate. And I think it's uh, very much in the spirit of our spirit of service initiative within the college. As far as what these, these folks that live at the, at the Westward, what they need the most, what do you think it is? Uh, what they will tell you they need is social connection yeah. and community. Yeah. We had a graduate student that worked with me about uh, four years ago and we did an assessment, we did surveys with 50 of the tenants. We were surprised to see that the vast majority of these people have actually pretty decent access to health care. Now what they don't have access to is community, is to family, uh, is something productive and meaningful to do during uh, their day. The vast majority of these people um, are disconnected from any kind of economic enterprise in terms of employment um, and that type of thing. And as a result, what I see outside my office window, which is right next to the main entrance on Fillmore, is the Phoenix Police Department and the Phoenix Fire Department showing up there about every other day. And they show up oftentimes very, very not criminal activity, but just nuisance kind of issues because there is no support system yeah. for many of these individuals to fulfill. So with this in mind, uh, it's it obviously, it, it just sounds like a great idea and it's up and operational. How did it get started? What was the idea behind this? Well, you know, when I, um, when I joined uh, Arizona State University and was fortunate enough to come to the downtown campus, I drove by that building and I saw the tenants sitting outside that building and I said, those are my people. Yeah. Those are the kind yeah. of people that our students in social work and our students in rec therapy need to have an experience to, and it is consistent with what we've done in the downtown area. You walk across the urban park to the Y, the partnership that we've created with the Y. This is just another extension of the mission of ASU at the downtown. So again, we've got nursing, we've got nutrition, we've got social work, we've got this uh, this psychosocial uh, situation going on. What else? Well, our plans are to um, bring in other disciplines. So we've got uh, conversations going on with colleagues over in uh, Tempe in uh, the Hugh Down School of Communications where we have faculty there with an expertise in health literacy. Um, we're going to begin to bring those um, disciplines in. Um, with the law school right here. I was going to say one the law the, school. Yes, and so we're moving toward creating a law clinic so we can have some law students opening up and having some clinic. Our hope is that uh, beginning in the next academic year we open up this collaboratory clinic to more than just the tenants. That a lot of the street people that wander up and down central and in this area mm -hmm. uh, provide a rich opportunity for our students to practice their craft. Starting to see more of a response, a little more engagement for some of those folks? Yeah, we're keeping a tick up on uh, the number of new faces we see uh, coming into <laughs> the clinic, and it's growing over time. You know, we did a uh, ice cream social back in July, and we probably had a hundred and fifty of the tenants show up, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to build community. Well, this is great. This is great work. It's very encouraging. It's wonderful to hear. Congratulations on your Thank success you. and continued success. Thank you. Thanks Ted. for joining us. Yeah. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalist's Roundtable. Another Inspector General's report finds problems with the Phoenix VA Hospital and Arizona's Department of Child Safety rejects key provisions of a state audit. That's on the next Journalist's Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.